blockchain and supply chain. Um, okay, so uh, what I think is useful to actually understand is that there is a lot of potential for the technology, and every technology goes through its ups and downs, right? So um, if we look at it from a perspective of how technology has changed our lives, and blockchain is one such technology which has tremendous potential, uh, we are in a bit of a blockchain winter now, so you know the euphoria of 2017-18 has died down a bit. But actually, what I'm going to talk about is the potential of the technology. If you look at what neutral sources claim, 10% of the global GDP uh, will be stored on blockchain base. So blockchain is a database, so you know blockchain databases will store 10% of global GDP uh, as per World Economic Forum. Another source is Gartner, which says that the value add from blockchain uh, will you know, accelerate to 175 billion, 2025, and 3.1 trillion. Now, these numbers could be way off the mark, but the point is you know, we are talking of that kind of potential of this business. Blockchain will not be a technology band-aid. It will actually replace the existing process in various industries. One in five banks have actually implemented a blockchain pilot. So there have been some uh, pilots that have been there, but really it's not really been a whole lot. Most of the pilots have been happening in US and China. And that's where India needs to catch up. The overall size of the blockchain market, as per markets and markets, <coughs> they're a neutral uh, market research firm, is you know, just 23.3 billion. These are very small numbers. So why is this important? Uh, there is a concept called exponential technologies. I don't know whether any of you actually have um, heard of Singularity University, but uh, exponential technology is something which states that um, for a few years, the growth is almost stagnant or zero. And therefore, you believe that something doesn't have potential because you, know, you don't see it growing or expanding rapidly. And then suddenly, when there is the movement from the early adopters to the early majority, you know, it's called crossing the chasm. I mean, we've all read the book. Uh, that's where suddenly it gets into network effects and the technology starts, you know, kind of pretty much, um, you know, getting to a critical mass. And so that's where we believe that maybe till 2023, uh, the market actually will be in that phase where it's actually stagnant growth, early stage, innovators to early adopters. And that's a very, very small percentage of the market. But from early adopters to early majority, that is where the market will explode. And that will happen probably post-2025. So most of you would know what is blockchain. So I just wanted to mention that you know, there is a lot of confusion around uh, distributed and decentralized. Uh, actually, decentralized is a subset of distributed systems, which uh, maybe any computer science person will tell you. But blockchain is a distributed ledger. What that means is that the ledger can be operated by multiple nodes anywhere they're located. It's actually distributed computing by the nodes. It's decentralized in the sense that each node can actually decide uh, whether they have the ability to create a block. I'll come to that. But both these are actually meaning the same thing. So there's no real confusion about these terms. It's distributed computing and decentralization of decisions. Right? So what that means is essentially blockchain is a set of blocks. A uh, particular set of transactions creates a cryptographic hash. It's a hash created by the content. Any small uh, digit or number you change in that, the hash changes. So if you have to basically tamper with anything, then the link to the previous block will get lost because the hash changes. So that's why the technology is powerful. And there are very few nodes which are actually, you know, things who are what is called Byzantine nodes, which are basically malicious nodes. So these people are trying to bring down the network, you know. So let's say some hacker somewhere is trying to um, bring down the network. So he votes, uh, you know, something which is not factual. So he basically uh, creates that, uh, you know, I would say the um, lack of consensus. Consensus is that if you have more than 51% voting for you, the block will be accepted and it will be you know, put onto the blockchain. And then the next block will come again after 10 minutes. 
It's a set of transactions, which is part of the ledger. And you're presuming that these are all voted for by neutral nodes, where people have an incentive to be honest. Uh, Bitcoin was the first um, implementation of blockchain. And I think a lot of us um, compare blockchain with Bitcoin. They're two completely different things. Bitcoin is an application, a cryptocurrency. Blockchain is the underlying infrastructure which creates processes which are efficient. And um, this is what is kind of uh, replacing entire processes across industries. And we'll come to that in a while. Uh, the consensus mechanism is you know, earlier proof of work. So a lot of mining that you hear of, you know, people who are actually trying to um, create the block, they get paid in uh, bitcoins. So every, and bitcoins, we know the value, uh, you know, I think it's come down a bit, but let's say $20,000, now it's maybe uh, $7,000, $8,000. So if you actually uh, crack a block, you get now I think one fourth of a bitcoin. So that's huge money, right, for, for someone who's, you know, sitting and cracking code. And um, proof of work meant that your computer was much more um, powerful. Uh, that is changing now, and you're actually having alternate consensus mechanisms like proof of uh, stake and uh, proof of elapsed time. So uh, proof of stake is that, you know, I put a particular stake uh, in terms of me voting as a node. If I uh, own 10% stake, which I've put in there, and I vote, then I have 10% voting rights, so it's like an almost shareholding pattern. The risk is if I vote incorrectly and I'm proven wrong, I lose that stake, which is why, again, you're trying to uh, inculcate and promote honest behavior. So there is a loss that that person will lose his stake, which is why he will not vote for something which is, you know, uh, you know I would say false or malicious. And proof of elapsed time is something, there's a uh, mechanism called um, Hyperledger Sawtooth, which was uh, originated by Intel. So this is the consensus mechanism they are following. And finally, what you have is a smart contract. So most of you would have heard of smart contract. So essentially, all the decisions in the process are coded into smart contract. Smart contract has nothing to do with legal contracts. In fact, it's not legally tenable, which is why now a lot of lawyers are trying to see how they can make this legally enforceable. Some com com uh, countries like Estonia and uh, probably Switzerland and others have started accepting these as legally tenable, but not uh, in India. So, so these are basically code which enables that each of the participants can choose to, um, uh, you know, basically get automatically paid if, let's say, their part of the contract is done. So, for instance, if I'm supposed to deliver something and I kind of put that in there, the smart contract recognizes that you know, this item has been delivered, so it automatically releases my payment, subject to the vote of the neutral nodes. And what that means is I don't have to go and chase up for payments and you know, do the traditional stuff that uh, you know, small vendors have to do with big companies. Right? So it, it removes that, that element of, uh, this is how blockchain looks like. You actually have uh, a peer-to-peer -peer network because most of the transactions happens between nodes, so that's peer-to-peer. -peer. Maybe individuals, it may be companies, it doesn't matter. They enter into transactions. The transactions which are loaded on and, uh, you know, the miner who has cracked the block creates a block which is the shortest, you know, uh, I would say set of uh, transactions um, uh, which are linked together. Uh, and that block is actually a series of blocks as the blockchain. And then there is a consensus mecha mechanism we talked about, proof of work or proof of stake, which uh, sits on top and enables the block because you know, that is seen by majority nodes as the one defining the set of transactions in the best possible way. And then you have something like you know, state machines and all that, which is the Ethereum uh, you know, virtual machines and all that, which enables the, the computation on the cloud. It's pretty much prevalent, but if you look at the, com the countries who have done the most work in blockchain, I would say a lot of East Europe, you know, countries like Estonia and all have actually made this legally enforceable. Uh, that's also where the innovation is coming. In terms of applications, right, I mean, that's the most important thing, you know, where does this apply? So it typically applies in, you know, things which are to do with uh, anti-counterfeiting, you know, like I said, you know, the security um, aspects that, you know, you can't, uh, you know, hack the network is very important. End-to-end -end, uh, traceability of supply chain. So a lot of uh, startups have done food traceability, you know, if you have organic foods or you have 
foods, um, uh, you know, which are uh, for a supermarket going from, you know, the country where it's originated to a supermarket in the U.S. shelves. Everyone wants to know that it actually came from where they say it came from. So a lot of organic stamped products. There's something called provenance. So provenance is how blockchain enables uh, you to prove that, you know, this was how this came through. Similarly, cold chains, you know, you want to ensure that the temperature uh, remained within the zone and it didn't get spoiled because some part of the chain, uh, you know, did not adhere to the temperature limitations. All this is stamped onto the blockchain uh, in supply chain and you can actually measure all this. So IoT and blockchain is a big, big area uh, where, uh, you know, both the IoT sensor data and blockchain as the repository of that data and transactions work in tandem to ensure uh, sanctity of, this, of uh, you know, the product and, uh, you know, give comfort to the customer, right? And uh, geographies, I think we've talked of, US and China have, have been doing the maximum number of pilots. A lot of this is to do with payments in banking, uh, remittances. Uh, there are also use cases in food supply chain, like we said, and, um, and also, of course, you know, uh, cross-border trade. And you're either permissionless or permissioned, right? So um, all the enterprise blockchains that came up earlier, which was with a set of nodes where all the participants participated, was what was called permissioned private blockchains, right? So Hyperledger is one example of that. When you look at Bitcoin, Ethereum, all these kind of Ripple, these are all public permissionless. Uh, so there is also a variant of public blockchain which is permissioned. So Ethereum, for instance, has both a permissionless and a permissioned blockchain. When you come to permissionless, and you look at, you know, let's say uh, neutral nodes voting, they have to be incentivized. And that incentivization has to come through Bitcoin or some token where they get, you know, payment for voting, right? It's like board of directors. If you call the directors for a, uh, this, you have to pay sitting fees to the board of directors, right? Same way for the nodes. Because they are not party to the transaction, they are validating your transaction. They have to be compensated, and that is through a token. So what you'll actually find is that financial services, healthcare, are really the places where the impact is the highest. And uh, what we are talking about, blockchain and supply chain, is really the second last category called transport and logistics. It's really from a cost-saving perspective that blockchain is being used. So what it essentially does is that um, if you really look at in supply chain, what is the biggest pain point? The biggest pain point is documents, right? So if, some, if I'm trying to export uh, you know, from India to US. I have a packing list, I have a bill of lading, I have, uh, uh, you know, uh, prepaid invoice, all kinds of documents which are coming together at one point. And then I have the custom clearance documents, which is coming from the custom authorities. All that I have to staple together, send it with the ship uh, and the container. And then at each point, it will get an additional document. And by the time it reaches the, you know, the port on the other side, you'll have a four inch thick set of documents which have to be managed. Managing this is at a huge cost, right? Um, I'm not even talking about, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, let's say, the, the things which are not related to the transaction. So, so there, I think what we find is that if you have something where you digitize all these documents and you don't really need to print out paper and you kind of have a central store where every party to that transaction has access to the same set of documents, that would lead to, you know, the true digital digitization of the documents. The second thing is related to float. So when a uh, importer bank pays the exporter bank, the importer and exporter bank is actually playing with the float, okay? So they, you know, the exporter bank will keep telling his client, which is the exporter, that uh, you know, money is not received. And uh, you know, it's taking time because it's cross-border. And the importer bank is holding onto the money till he's forced to remit by you know, Bank of International Settlements. So one is you have BIS as the regulator, uh, it's a kind of, uh, it's like the equivalent of RBI for a cross-border, uh, you know, a payment. And you have uh, importer and exporter banks trying to play with float. Float means I have money on my account, which actually belongs to the customer, but I'm not transferring it to, you know, whoever he owes it to. So I'm playing with that interest, you know, so interest cost because I have that money, right? So float can be as high as 21 days in an export transaction. And what blockchain does is it reduces it to worst case two days. I mean, it, it could be instantaneous as well. So, so if I have that ability to reduce float, I have an ability to kind of make the documentation seamless. 
I mean, just imagine the kind of cost saving that applies in the sector, right? And what we actually really need here is that we need that true consensus mechanism which brings in part of the permissionless systems into what is essentially a permission network. Trade Lens is a blockchain which has been created by Maersk and IBM. The biggest challenge that this uh, platform faced was adoption by shipping lines. And why was that? This was because Maersk was a competitor and the largest player in the segment. So if you actually have uh, a person who has 21% market share, who kind of understands what is the rates that Hapagloid or you know, um, CCA, CCM, and all these you know, big similar com competitors are charging to their competitors for transporting you know, goods from Navasheva port to Rotterdam, uh, it immediately is you know, like opening up your books to a competitor. So the biggest adoption challenge was creating that neutrality and the fact that Maersk would not get access to any of the data which was re not related to them. If they were not party to this transaction, they would not get access to this data. So that's where uh, they created a 5149 JV uh, joint venture, which would actually not have really Maersk as a company having any role to play in this uh, blockchain pilot or blockchain initiative, which was called the uh, GTD, the Global Trade Digitization. So what it essentially did was it ensured confidentiality, like Corda, like we said, you know, only the parties to the transaction uh, could participate. Uh, it had you know, uh, only those nodes, but it tried to broaden the number of nodes because uh, uh, when does a malicious attack happen? When uh, the malicious actors control more than 50% of the voting rights. So you have to ensure there are so many neutral participants that at least 51% or more should be the honest actors. Today the challenge in blockchain adoption is that technology is hard. And a lot of people who are conventional programmers have to put in a lot more effort to understand you know, Golang programming and Hyperledger, which is also where the adoption is, is, is getting slow. But you know, once the pilots come off the chain, what it does to the process is, you know, I mean, the benefits are there to see. And obviously, you have to have faith in it. And uh, as you know, was said earlier, you have to um, you know, believe in it for two to three years to actually see it fructify. Thank you very much. Thank you.